Thanks. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. And looking at some of the headlines today, I was kind of hoping today was actually April Fool's Day, frankly. <laughs> Every day is April Fool's but Day, But then brother. again, yes, yeah, but I'm bummed you got there before I did. Yeah. I let it linger too much. I was going to go there, and uh, you were picking up when I was laying down quicker than I was able to pick it up. So, but yes, pretty much... When you're living in the decline and fall of a once great republic, every day uh, is April Fool's Day. Or another way of saying that is everyone does what is wise in their own eyes. Another way of saying every day is April Fool's Day. Don't be a fool by um, getting any other cup of coffee than our friends over at First Cup, though. Make sure you try their flavor for every freedom-loving American because they make great coffee and they share your values at the same time. So you can go to firstcup.com and use my last name, Dace, as a promo code to get 10% off. Firstcup.com, promo code Dace for 10% off. And if you subscribe, you get an additional 10% for the life of the subscription at firstcup.com, promo code Dace. There is a ton of going on today. One thing in particular that that we're going to need to spend a good deal amount of time on. Next hour, we do have some questions, I take it, for Ask Me Anything. We do. Load it up. All right. And since, Aaron, you're still here. I am. No baby yet. Nope. But imminent. Yes. Today is the technical due date. Yep. So you could be getting a call at any second. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, while we still can, let's get to it, because who knows how many more of these days we've got in the next couple of weeks. Here is Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Weakness. Donald Trump issued a statement this morning about the topic of baby murder ahead of the 2024 election. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. The baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Meanwhile, at the Vatican, the Pope, along with the Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith, has released the Dignitas Infinita, or the Infinite Dignity, a document, a proclamation, in which they explicitly condemn gender theory, so-called gender transition surgeries, baby killing, surrogacy, and more, as inadmissible ideologies within the Catholic Church. The document begins by stating, quote, in the light of Revelation, capital R, Revelation, the Church resolutely reiterates and confirms the ontological dignity of the human person created in the image and likeness of God. and redeemed in Jesus Christ. The declaration also describes gender theory as a, quote, concession to the age-old temptation to make oneself God. On surrogacy, Pope Francis is quoted in the document saying, quote, the path to peace calls for respect for life, for every human life, starting with the life of the unborn child in the mother's womb, which cannot be suppressed or turned into an object of trafficking. He also calls the surrogacy industry, quote, deplorable. The declaration also describes the aforementioned topics, along with abortion, transgender surgeries, and other matters as, quote, grave violations of human dignity. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, when did Pope Francis get to the right of Donald Trump? Moving on, late last week, Joe Biden reportedly had a testy phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, where the former reportedly threatened the latter with withholding of support for Israel if Israel proceeds with military operations in southern Gaza. Biden also reportedly used the stray IDF airstrike that killed seven humanitarian workers as sort of rationale for his threats. Over the weekend on CBS News, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby seemed to confirm that support for Israel is now conditioned on whether or not Israel decides to root out the remaining dregs of Hamas in southern Gaza. He was very clear in his call with the prime minister that if we don't see some changes in their policies in Gaza and the way they're prosecuting operations, we're going to have to make some changes of our own. You do think these are Israeli policies then to block aid? They have, they have, they get to decide how they prosecute this war. It's their operation. We just talked about them pulling troops out and what that means. They get to decide how they 
prosecute operations. We get to decide how we're going to react to that and how we're going to administer our own policy with respect to Gaza. In completely unrelated news, here's an Al Quds Day rally in Dearborn, Michigan. Malcolm X said, and I quote, we live in one of the rottenest countries that, have ever, that has ever existed on this earth. It's not Genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. Any system that would allow such atrocities and such devilry to, a ha to happen and would support it, such a system does not deserve to exist on God's earth. In other news, March U.S. disability data was released since we last spoke. The bad news, as commentator Ed Dowd points out, is that we've seen back-to-back -back increases since January in rates of disability claims. The good news is that we've not seen new highs. Again, we've shown you this graphic before. This is U.S. disability claims since 2009. And just look at that extreme spike in the middle of 2021 and pretty much sustained to the current day. What happened? And finally, South Carolina head women's basketball coach Don Staley was asked a very easy question during a press conference ahead of her team's victory over the Iowa Hawkeyes in the national championship game on the women's side. Here's how that went. Dan Zakrzewski, outkick coach. You just talked about, you know, what a massive weekend this is, obviously, for women's basketball, women's sports in general. One of the major issues facing women's sports right now is the debate discussion topic about the inclusion of transgender athletes, biological males in women's sports. I was wondering if you would tell me your position on that issue. Um, damn, you got deep on me, didn't you? I, I, I'm on the, I mean, I'm on the, the opinion of, of, if you're a woman, you should play. If you consider yourself a woman or, and you want to play sports or, or vice versa, you should be able to play. I'm sorry. <laughs> nice try and good luck to you. And, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, man. And that's what happened while we were away. Very well done. Aaron's <laughs> Montage brought to you by our friends over at Hillsdale College. I know a lot of you are disheartened after watching that montage, frankly, um, but uh, especially seeing what is becoming of this uh, once exceptional country. If that's you, take advantage of uh, the numerous free courses they have at Hillsdale. One of the ones that's really hot right now is from noted historian Victor Davis Hanson. It's called American Citizenship and its decline. It traces the history of citizenship. It explains how uh, it is being undermined in America by open borders, identity politics, et cetera. And the correlation there, uh, the symbiosis between uh, the, er the erosion of citizenship and our freedoms, the erosion of freedoms uh, and our citizenship. Sign up today for this free online course, American Citizenship and Its Decline. Don't be one of those people who perish for a lack of knowledge. Go to dace4for, dace4hillsdale.com. Again, that's daceforhillsdale.com. You know, maybe there is, uh, maybe there's something to this lunar eclipse thing. Okay. Because I've been dreading this from Trump, the entire campaign. I, it was very clear this was heading here, you know. But to have it come today, the day of the eclipse, to have him say with a straight face, that everybody agreed on both sides, Roe versus Wade had to go. Were, were you aware of this, Don? That everyone agreed? That it was bad law and it had to go? Legal scholars on both sides. Were, were, that's not my recollection. No, that, that's not mine either. Um, maybe somebody could have told us this the last 50 years and we could have just gotten right to it then, right? Everybody wanted it. I mean, I, I don't even know what that means. It, it's not reality. I, I don't know if that's a Trump variant. Um, you know, but uh, on this earth, in this timeline, that was not true. I mean, we, we do know 
that Donald Trump is a multi-gifted uh, individual, um, always smart, always correct, always hiring the best people. And Jesus has his very hand on his shoulder. We know this. I've seen the paintings. Yeah, indeed. We, these are things we know, stipulated to. So perhaps in the midst of his transcendence, as he commiserates bef- you know, back and forth among different realms uh, and dimensions and portals, he just got this timeline and Earth mixed up with another one where everyone agreed on both sides that Roe versus Wade was bad law and had to go. I just was not a, but was it a nine nothing vote either? I mean, was it nine nothing the vote to get rid of Roe? Mm, again, that does not seem no. to be what happened. No. So it, as recently as two Junes ago, that was not the case. Okay. So uh, there's really no point in even saying something like that. That's that's the thing about this era that really bothers me. One of well, that's not true. <laughs> that's one of many things about this era that really bothers me. It all bothers me. It's I understand a certain amount of obfuscation goes part and parcel with politics. Okay, I get it. Hey, spoiler alert: politicians may lie. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but it's the it's the lying about stuff you don't even have to lie about. It's the lying about stuff you don't have to lie about. That's the thing that just kind of tells you me when the truth is not in a person, when they will just lie about things that they don't have to lie about. And that that's gaslighting. An extreme form of it, and it bothers me. So what? it is it is simply not true. We're not going to spend the next 20 minutes on this point, but it is simply not true. And if you think that it is, I, I would urge you to seek psychoanalysis. Turn as Mike Tyson, the great prophet, once said, turn off your station and and get psychoanalysis immediately. It's not true that everyone agreed on both sides that Roe versus Wade had to go. I can't believe I have to say this, but a, but apparently I do. Did you want to say something well, on this quickly and then we are going to well, move on? What do on you to think about the contingent on the right, all names you would know, and at least some of them who don't have a history we want to call liars? People have even been on the show that, that say a, a variation of that is that I, I thought we wanted federalism. This is, this is federalism. Um, then I guess we should have slavery state by state. Hmm. That's federalism. I mean, if, 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 what if an individual state decides you can molest your children? I mean, that, that I mean, so it took what's you, wrong just with that? to be clear, it took you three seconds to Correct. blow up all of that. Well, moment. you know why? Well, because I, you know, I thought this was the party of Lincoln, not Stephen Douglas, but I thought this was the party of Lincoln who once famously said, no government has the right to do that which God says is wrong. By the way, where do our rights come from? Um, federalism? Uh, they come from God. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And the moral code of the country are the laws of nature and nature's God. Federalism? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank and, you. There, and therefore, your interpretation of federalism is through those filters, not the other way around. So I got it reversed. Got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. God, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. But um, I didn't have... I've, so I, I, I've been dreading this. Of course, it has to come on the day of the lunar eclipse. And it has to, and it comes ironically at a time something as rare as a lunar eclipse also occurred, which Aaron displayed the juxtaposition of in his montage. For whatever reason, this pope decided today to be Catholic. Well, Aquinas I mean, I mean, summa theologica there. Yeah, I mean, if if I if I had told you, John Paul II wrote what word for word what Aaron read, would you believe it? Uh, yeah. By and large, I would too. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Is this like way, this compared to the statement they did earlier this year we talked about is another layer of clarity. This is frankly out of character for this papacy. And, 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 well, um, see, I, I totally appreciate the lens you guys view it through, which mm-hmm. has got to be endlessly frustrating because it's funny watching for Protestants to like actively root for the Catholic Church. Please be church. Catholic. Please yes, be Catholic. I know. It's yes. true. Yeah. But he had actually he had said things about these two issues in very recent memory that led me to believe that it was going to be 
it, the truth was going to be in there. What I was going to worry about, whether it was so foggy, anybody could find it. Like the which, statement we talked about a few months ago. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this ends up being not only being true, but like everybody's like, oh, damn, that's like yeah. there's no confusion at all. That, that's that's declarative. I mean, that's. Amen. I have nothing left to say to that other than amen. So here, here's what I'm not going to do for the, for, and, and you know, Bob Vanderplatz will be on at the, uh, at, at the next segment. And it's again, ironic timing. This would of course be right in his wheelhouse as one of the, you know, leaders of one of the most influential Christian conservative groups in the country. We'll, we'll see what he has to say. Here's what I'm not going to do, which may surprise some of you. I am, I, I had a conversation over Twitter this morning with, uh, Doug Stafford, he's the longtime chief strategist for Senator Rand Paul. And he said on Twitter, this was the absolute weakest statement on this issue he's ever seen from a politician on either side. That's that's a bar. That's something. That's a bar. I mean, well, he's right. I mean, for the first time, officially, we have two pro-choice, officially. I mean, John McCain, Romney, these guys would have been the same, but they wouldn't have said this. But officially, we have two candidates that are officially pro-choice running as major party nominees. Here's what here's what most of the what most of what's going to be written in corporate media about this. Let me just get rid of this now from the outset. Um, they're going to want to discuss what this means with Trump and his relationship with uh, evangelicals and pro-lifers. Okay, um, I'm just going to tell you right now, Donald Trump could perform an abortion at Mar-a-Lago. Straight up, just perform one, and. Many evangelical leaders who are silent today, if you go into their Twitter feeds, no comment, uh, many of them would be silent about it. Uh, they would then wait for the next Biden abomination, which is usually only about three to five seconds away, to be fair to them. It's coming, coming around the bend, mm-hmm. right? They would wait for that, and then that would be all of their conversation. Um, and many of their people who care more about the Republican Party and winning elections than the gospel and the kingdom would nod their heads they wouldn't face criticism from their own congregations about this because they have been discipled thusly. And this is this the symptom of a sector of the church that has lost its salt and is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And then you have too many pro-life leaders who are seen, you know, believe in seat at the table politics. Our president, Gaston Mooney, when he worked for uh, Senator Jim DeMint on Capitol Hill, referred to them as big baby. Uh, this is just an excuse to have a parade uh, every, in January and an issue to fundraise off of. Um, I mean, th- they're much more involved in the intricacies of the hierarchy of the GOP uh, than saving children. And I mean, these are just hirelings in both camps. They're going to fulfill their vocations. So and, and 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 then if Trump loses again, what they'll do, just like they did for Romney, just like they did for McCain, just like they did for the Bushes, when these guys, when these people lose, they'll come back and blame their own people that we didn't that that um, not enough Christians showed up to vote for the guy who said he was pro-choice. That that that's the game. Nothing's really changed. I've done that show. Aaron grew up literally listening to that show. Okay, Todd, I've been doing that show as long as you and I've been friends, and this is the 20th year we've been friends. Okay, I've 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 done enough. I'm I'm tired of that show. I'm bored by it. I'm just I've kicked the dust off my sandals and moved on. I'm not doing that show. But that's what most of the conversation's going to be about, because the media, the corporate media, is going to look to discredit the evangelical church, and much of the evangelical church is going to help them do that. I'm just I'm moving on. I'm not. I don't want to discuss that. It is what it is. Nothing's changed. I told you for years, the cake is n- the same. Nothing's changed. Just like I said to you a few minutes ago, if I told you that John Paul II wrote that, would you believe it? Mm-hmm. If I told you Mitt Romney 2012, that if, I, if you had not seen that video and I gave you a transcription of this and said, this is what Mitt Romney 2012 said about the abortion issue, would you believe it? Yeah. If I told you this is what uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush said in 1992 about the abortion issue, would sure. you believe it? If I told you this is what John McCain said about the abortion issue in 2008, would you believe it? Right. Exactly. Nothing's changed. Different people are making money off the same scam, but nothing's changed substantively. Nothing's changed. The frosting is zanier. It's a different flavor, but the cake is still baked the same. I also would urge you, by the way, not to get too morally worked up about this. I mean, during the 2016 primary on the Cruz campaign, we caught Trump giving like five different positions on abortion. 
I mean, the, the, I mean, I guess the good or bad, depending on how you look at it, when your standard bearer is a man whose number one conviction is his own ambition, you can use that to your advantage and disadvantage, right? So he took five different squish positions on abortion during the primary. By the time we get to October, he's standing up there with Hillary Clinton on national TV saying, I'm going to appoint justices that overturn Roe. And then he did it, right? He did do it, right? Yeah. Okay, so if you don't like Trump's position on something of great clarity now, hang out for a bit, push back a little. You're likely to get something more you like down the line, particularly when, look at the polls, gives him a completely different narrative than what he thinks he's saying right now. Fair? Fair. Just for that to happen, we have to wait for Biden to elevate, which is always fun. Well, that's happening now if you look at the betting markets because they've gone from oh. Trump by 20 points to 50-50 Wuhan luck. over the weekend. Yes. So there's that. Nobody saw that coming. Though. Exactly. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, you would have just guessed that's what all of last year's coverage was, was, was going towards. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. But nevertheless, I want to discuss what I am far more fascinated by. The politics of this. Because this has been attempted, what he is trying to do has been attempted by Republicans before in the pre row era. Every one of them that tried it lost. Every one. Why? Well, since Roe versus Wade, every presidential candidate but one who won Catholic voters. Well, Steve, you said whoever wins suburbanites went. Well, there's a lot of crossover between suburbanites yes. and Catholics? Yes. Yeah, okay. The reason Catholics vote like this is largely because they become soft-headed suburbanites. You're talking about the same the Yeah, the, 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 the overlap on. there is yeah. pretty pretty, pretty prevalent. Yes. Okay, yeah. All right. Not not a lot of Catholics guys at, uh, you know, Bedford-Stuyvesant. Fair? <laughs> okay. Not a lot of Catholics rolling around the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Fair? Okay. You tend to find them a lot in the suburbs. All right? So, since Roe v. Wade, every presidential election but one that was won by the candidate that got the majority of the Catholic vote. The only exception was the first time George W. Bush uh, won the presidency in 2000. He was the first president in well over a century to win the Electoral College without the popular vote. So it was a great anomaly at the time. It's not now. We've seen it happen a couple times now. Uh, but it was a great anomaly at the time. And he lost him to Gore by like one and a half points. I mean, it was razor thin. That's the only time in 50 years that if you lost the Catholic vote, you got to take the oath of office. The only time. And as we have pointed out before, because we are so stunned by what the Pope said on a non-abortion cultural issue just now, right? If you were to take abortion politics off the table, much of contemporary soft-headed Catholic social teaching, Todd, lines up with which party? more than more often than not oh it's just the the romanticized be nicer than god left. correct now the training issue is threatening based on what the pope said today is threatening to add a second issue to that reason to vote republican but i can i think you can count on republicans trying to blow that issue too with bruce gender evergreen yeah exactly okay so in the in the pre-row in the row era you had to win catholics to win Every Republican presidential candidate that tried this lost, or a variation of it lost. Mitt Romney actually ran pro-choice television ads in five states in 2012. He lost all five states. Why? Because you have to understand there are issues, there are where people stand on issues, and then there are issues that people will actually vote on them. Like guns, I've used this analogy before. Gun control polls better typically than the Second Amendment does. But most people who vote on guns are staunch Second Amendment advocates, which is why, despite public polling that shows, in general, we are for some form of gun confiscation, the majority of people who actually vote on that issue, meaning I go to the polls for that issue, or that's one of the issues I go to the polls for, tend to be staunchly Second Amendment. That's why, despite what the polls say, generally, when, when you act on that issue, the intensity is usually majority on the side of those in favor of defending gun rights. That's, that's the uh, same thing happens here. Are there a lot of people that probably hold the position on abortion that Trump articulates in that video? Yes. But almost none of them are voting on that issue. Almost none of them are. The intensity on the issue is you're somewhere between where Steve Dace is and where Planned Parenthood is. 
you're on, you're 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 within the you're within the orbit, even if you're not in you know geosynchronous alignment with me, on you know no exceptions at all. You're somewhere in the orbit. We're in the same solar system together, or you're in the other solar system over there. There's there's like no middle ground. If you're voting on that issue, you feel strongly one way or the other on that issue. This is why this language has never worked when it's been tried, because you end up muzzling your own base. And then the other side, nobody in the other side thinks, wow, I'm going to look at you in a totally new light. No, you are instantly still the most anti-reproductive freedom candidate of all time and that, that, that we've ever seen emerge in the history of the Alpha Quadrant, period, no matter what. Now, he's going to try to do this while being the guy that overturned Roe. To quote Lucius Fox in The Dark Knight, good luck. No, dude, that won't work. Donald Trump is preaching to a constituency that does not exist. This is a very important point to understand. This is no different than the autopsy after 2012 when Reince Priebus went out. They put out that ridiculous autopsy, remember, and said we have to give up on every issue and become Democrats. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then, then the guy wins the nomination and wins the presidency with like the most incendiary right wing language we've ever seen in Donald Trump. Right? Go picking fights with the NFL. I'm gonna overturn Roe. We're gonna throw back the rapists and thieves to Mexico. Right? The most incendiary. All the stuff we were told we couldn't say and win. He did. Right? Total and total. It, he totally contradicted the autopsy. This is Donald Trump actually going right in Priebus, 2012, not back to Donald Trump 2016. So this begs the question, if it is ultimately about his ambition that you said earlier, and I think you're right about that, when that means just winning this thing, the question becomes, why? I think that this, you, you, do, you take calculations like this when you, when you represent a constituency but don't share their convictions. So you don't understand them. Does nobody on his team understand You don't them? get into the sanctum of Donald Trump's team saying the things I'm saying right now. You do not. You don't. So the answer is no. Or if they do, they are not going to say a damn word about it. Because that's how you're no longer in the team. But this constituency doesn't work. This was, this is no different than after 2012, we need uh, small government people who believe in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? That was the big thing, okay? Th those voters didn't, ex never existed. I told you they didn't exist. And then Pew did a massive survey and told us those, these voters literally don't exist. If anything, there was more of a market for people that wanted bigger government and social conservatism, which is kind of Trump's constituency mm -hmm. proved that to be true. This voter doesn't exist. There is not a single woman in America, not a single, single woman in America who's like, well, I'm going to totally forget that he overturned Roe and I think he's literally Hitler. I, that's a reasonable position. Thanks, Don. Nope. Doesn't happen. And if you're if you're and, and they're telling people that their big strategy in this election now is to go turn out Christian voters they've never gotten before. Well, I can tell you the, the Christian voters that are kind of part of Trump's TBN coalition, they're maxed out. You got all those people. The kinds of Christian voters you're looking for are a lot of those are people in those suburban megachurches we're talking about all the time that are generically conservative, but don't want to get their hands dirty. Right. Right. OK, so you're going to go to them and tell them, all right. I need you to vote for me when you didn't the last time or the last two times, but I'm not going to be pro-life now. That pastor's never letting you in through the front door. You just gave him an excuse to continue to, to puss out. Straight up. I'll just say it straight up. You gave him an excuse to continue to puss out. He gets, he gets to continue to not address any of these issues because you copped out on the number one issue for his people. You copped out. So he's not going to let you in. So all you did, this is a point of diminishing returns. This constituency doesn't exist. Yes. Is this basically the Stephen Douglas position? So I guess we could, I used to, I've spoken at numerous Lincoln dinners. I guess you got to stop booking me for those. Start doing Stephen Douglas dinners. Yeah, it's the Stephen Douglas position. Is it morally repugnant? Sure. Absolutely. But I don't find that nearly as interesting as just how politically stupid the whole thing is. This constituency has heretofore proven not to exist. Will it maybe prove to exist in a post-Roe world? We'll find out.
Hey, back here on the Steve Day Show, and we love it when we have brand new partners on the program, and we want to welcome to the show Voice of Judah. Uh, if you're a you're, if you're a Christian, chances are you probably break down into one of two camps where the nation of Israel is concerned. Um, you think that uh, either you've got a sacred duty to honor and respect Israel, or you would be excited and or you would be excited about the prospect of reaching more of Israel for Christ. Well, that's exactly the ministry, uh, a focus of uh, a voice of Judah, Israel. It's a messianic ministry focused in the heartland of Israel, uh, aims to inspire evangelism, discipleship, and church planting in the in the nation of Israel, uses humanitarian outreach to support Israelis, uh, to fulfill uh, the Christian obligation to show them the love of Christ. The fields are ripe for harvest in the Holy Land, right where our faith was born now is the time uh, to seize that moment. So if you want to take advantage of that uh, and uh, to uh, bless the Jewish people, but with the greatest blessing of them all, Jesus, uh, the fields are ripe for harvest there. Seize the moment with our friends at uh, Voice of Judah Israel. Uh, visit their website at uh, VOJ Israel, voiceofjudahisrael.org slash Steve to learn more about their inspiring work. V as in victory, OJ, voiceofjudahisrael.org, voiceofjudahisrael.org slash Steve. That's voiceofjudahisrael.org slash Steve. All right, let's get some more commentary on the former president's uh, position statement. And again, I'll, I just want to reiterate what I said a few minutes ago. If you're morally upset about this, I mean, I, I was on a campaign that competed against Donald Trump every day in 2016. He gave like five different positions on the abortion issue and they were all very squishy. And then, uh, you know, two weeks before the election, he stands up to Hillary Clinton and says, I'm going to appoint the justices that overturn Roe and then actually did it. So the good and bad of having a standard bearer who has absolutely no convictions at all beyond his own ambitions are that you're never quite really sure where he stands that's the bad news. The good news is you're never quite really sure where he stands because he does have a tendency to respond to external stimuli. All right. Uh, so with that, um, let's bring in our good friend Bob Vanderplas from the Family Leader. Obviously, organizations like yours are deeply impacted when the top of the Republican ticket, at least as of today, April 8th, okay? And there's still 30 weeks to the election, so I think we both know Trump's capable of another two or three of these, at least, right? <laughs> Don't you think? All right. So at least today, 30 weeks before the election, as of now, the Republican presidential candidate is officially pro-choice. So your reaction both... You, well, either or. You can discuss it morally, politically, or both, but the floor is yours, Bob. Well, I've talked about this openly. Even when uh, President Trump was president, and then obviously when he was running again uh, in the 2020 election, and then obviously uh, running in the caucuses for the 2024 in the primary, is that, uh, you know, Trump's a friend, so I say we're, we call balls and strikes. When he does things well, we cheer him on. When he goes outside the bounds, we hold, we, we're, we're a voice of accountability, and we do that all in the context of we're going to pray for him. And what I've also told people, and Steve, you just alluded to this, uh, at his core, he's a transactional leader. He's done that his entire life. I mean, real estate is a transactional leadership. And so getting the three justices to overturn Roe v. Wade, that was a transaction that he made in the 2016 campaign. I'll give you a list of, give me a list of judges. I'll make sure your Supreme Court justices come from those, and that'll lead to the overturn of Roe v. Wade. And he is very, very happy about that. Even in today's statement, he's still claiming a lot of credit for overturning Roe v. Wade. But now he's making a transaction and a calculus with the American voter. Now, listen, there's a backlash because of the overturn of Roe v. Wade. I want to win the presidential election. So I want to give this statement on abortion where Susan B. Anthony List is coming out against him. Marjorie Dannensfelser, exceptionally disappointing. You're ceding the argument of Democrats. We need a champion. We need a leader for the sanctity of human life. His best friend that you and I talk about on this show every now and then, Lindsey Graham, goes after him saying, listen, the pro-life movement is about the well-being of the unborn. It's not about geography. And if this is a state's rights issue, then you must be okay with Alabama having slavery, but Iowa doesn't. You know, some things are right and some things are wrong. So this is not a federalist debate. It's a moral debate. 
And what we'd like to see is That's a, the same Lindsey Graham that attacked us on the Cruz presidential campaign sure. for being too pro-life. Sure. Okay. But what I'm saying, though, is that uh, what we'd like to do is see a leader right now, especially after the overturn of Roe v. Wade. You want to have a leader right now who understands the sanctity of human life, the gift of the sanctity of human life. You talk about the mother that's involved, the dad that's involved, the family that's involved, an opportunity for the church to be the church, but to cast a vision for a culture of life for this country. What President Trump has done, and on a day where, as you guys were talking about earlier, another thing should be making the news is the Pope's leadership on gender, leadership that we cheer on. If you're born a boy, I mean, you're a boy. This is so surprising that you just used the phrase the Pope's leadership unironically for maybe the in first time since Francis became Pope. Oh, sure. But yeah. what, what we're saying is that that's where you call balls and strikes as well, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was talking to Todd and Todd saying, you know, that, you know, really, we were kind of amazed at this thing, that he would take this clear of a stance on this. But that's leadership. We're looking for that type of leadership on the sanctity of human life. So my concern, Steve, is electorally. This dampens and puts questions in your own base that you're going to rely on to be your support. But I don't see the voter that exists that he's going after, that he's going to win over. And you're already seeing the Biden campaign and the Democrats blasting Trump for being the one that overturned Roe v. Wade and why he's... Which they would have done no matter what position he took. That's our point. Exactly. Yeah. Their, their rhetoric was going to be the same no matter what he said yep. today. Donald Trump, just as I said a few minutes ago, Trump could have performed an abortion. And there is a cadre of evangelical leaders oh, sure. that would have looked the other way. Donald Trump could have come up, come out today and said, um, could have performed an abortion. And Joe Biden would, in the White House would have issued the exact same statement. Exactly. There's nothing he can say. as the So why try to curry favor with people who yep. hate you and will never support you? The one part that he did say, Steve, if you go to that point, the one part he did say in the video, the one part he said, a statement that we definitely agree with is pointing out the Democrats' extreme position on this issue. But to me, that's where he should have stuck with but it. But then he turns around and says and he's okay if the state if the state enacts that. Because then. what is, if Massachusetts right. enacts that very legislation yeah. up till the time of birth or after birth, we're okay with it? No, we're not okay with you've it. You've ever been to a Lincoln dinner in the Republican Party? <laughs> yeah. I bet you've been to a few. I've been to a couple of Lincoln dinners. Yeah, probably dinners. spoken in a few like I, I, spoke, I have. Yeah, I mean, are, are, we do, are we doing St- Stephen Douglas dinners now, I guess, right? Yeah. So to me, I, I don't get the logic of it the other part i don't get is why today you know why why, unless you're trying to say i'm going to insert this into the campaign early so we move on and get behind it uh but i think what this does is puts more of a focus on it and my fear is it dampens the base of support that trump is going to need to win and only invigorates the democrats base that Biden is counting on to win. All right, one more question I want to ask you, and then Todd and Aaron, I'm going to let you guys chime in next, okay? You've talked on our show before about the Daniel Initiative, and you guys kind of launched this as a pilot, or you kind of launched this as a pilot during the Iowa caucuses in 2016. 2016. And and, and basically the goal is is to find Christians who have not voted before and get them to vote now. And, and which, and, and your approach has found that typically Christians do not vote because they believe that um, the process is too dirty. And so you appeal to them with a very high minded, principled message, right? Okay. You bet. I've been told by some very well placed little birdies in the Trump uh, world in the last couple of months that they're not even going to try to make any play for suburban women at all. They think that's unwinnable for him. That what they're going to try to do is get a higher turnout of Christian voters, kind of an ex- kind of what you guys are doing. You bet. Okay, but again, if 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 you guys have properly identified the kind of Christian who doesn't vote, then they're in a lot. Of, they're going to be found in a lot of these suburban mega churches that don't want to let politics in because it's too dirty, right? If you're now not even pro life anymore, but you're officially pro choice, how do you get? Just think of a few of the large suburban churches in our own neighborhoods that are yeah. not political, would never let you speak or have an event there, okay? Wouldn't let, you pa- wouldn't let me pass out voter guides there, all right? What's the pitch to go to those pastors and say, hey, we need you now to get involved for the very first time with a candidate who's not even, a, who's not even officially pro-life? Wouldn't that just give them an excuse to just continue to keep doing what they're it, doing? It's the excuse they're looking for, and it dampens the enthusiasm. It dampens their willingness to get involved. To give you a, the, your, your viewers, though, Steve, a little bit of backdrop to this, 37% of believers who attend church on a regular basis and who are registered to vote, are not voting. 
So what our goal is to say, let's get to the shepherds to say, this is your prophetic call to be the timeless voice to a culture. And in America, you have the opportunity to vote. And these are the churches that still believe in the inerrancy of God's word, that Jesus is the way, not a way. And you want these pastors speaking into this election. But you're right. If the pastor's feeling like, what difference does it make? You just gave them every excuse to say, I'm just going to stay out of this thing altogether. I've said right away uh, when Trump was going to be the nominee, he better hope and pray that our efforts are successful to mobilize that base to go to the polls because they're definitely not going to vote for Biden because of the extreme position. The problem is if you offered a nuanced position that is, you know, basically pro-choice at this point, now you've given them an out. You cannot give them out. You need them to want to take a stand for this election. All right, Todd and Aaron, you're up. Well, I have nothing but deeply cynical analysis uh, to then offer. Then it's probably correct. <laughs> um, but listen, in a s state like Iowa, which port I think portended things to come, where Iowa evangelicals already voted for him by a two-to-one margin, I think you asked the crowd, and I ask it with a straight face, and I set this up as a, uh, a seed I was purposely planting with a punchline all, all along, but it's... I do that because it's true. What matters more to that population? Uh, what Trump just said about abortion or whether they tried to, whether he tried to sell them a Bible two weeks ago. And that's not a joke. I think these are directly linked. I think he, for whatever reason, doesn't have to make sense to you or to anybody else under the sun. But that was cover. The question is, are you going to fall for it? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, the whole idea about the selling of the Bible, a matter of fact, and I talked about that, is that so you got Biden's administration who's saying we're going to we're going to celebrate diversity, whatever it was called, day on Easter uh, to basically highlight the trans transgender, yeah, yeah, yeah. trans visibility day is what it was called on Easter. At the same time, Trump's taking hits for, you know, selling the Bible. Now, whether people believe he should get royalties off it and I get I said, at least he's getting some people back into the word and calling people back to pray. But now you insert this commentary yeah. on abortion, this statement on abortion. And that's where it is. And so I believe our team just talked about this. What do we do about this now? What we do is make sure that we're a bigger voice and we try to mo we try to uh, influence the church in regards to the pro-life message, the pro-life movement. And maybe, as Steve said, you know, Trump will probably insert himself two or three, four or five more times in the campaign on this. Can you move him any way or direction? Because he's already the nominee. You're being asked to do a impossible lift. In my estimation, Steve has already summed up exactly what's going on here. He's trying to get votes that he cannot possibly ever get. Meanwhile, what you let out on this thing, we would absolutely vote for him if he committed the abortion himself. Yep. We're so different yep. that we are utterly different human beings. We will sell out every turn and somehow mm -hmm. sell out at every turn and somehow do it in the name of God. Yep. They don't believe in God. They never sell out. Hey, you know, Todd, you don't have to convince me. Oh, that. I know, yeah, man. Yeah, I know, yeah. brother. However, I, I think what our job is to do, and we always said this, when Roe v. Wade got overturned, it took 50 years to overturn it. Now it's an opportunity for the church to be the church. But what we need to do, because and you see this all throughout the scriptures as well, where God has used a king along with a prophet. He's used, uh, say, Pharaoh and Joseph, Nathan and David. He's always used that. You need a champion in that position to echo the voice of the church. And that's what we're trying to say with a Donald Trump. Hopefully that a Marjorie Dansfels or the SBA or even a Lindsey Graham who he listens to to say, you know, we're exceptionally disappointed. Will we move him at all? I don't know. But I believe he has to move or he continues to dampen the base in which he needs in order to win. Aaron? There is an epidemic, I believe, of people who say things, and it would have been better if they would have said nothing at all. Not good that they said nothing, but it would have been better than saying what they actually said. A couple of examples of this. It's, this is in the vein of, it's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. It's kind of in the same vein. Uh, just in our backyard, the, the demon statue at the state capitol. There were people both locally and nationally on Twitter who were defending that. There, there's no good argument to have a, a statue of Baphomet in a state capitol. Again, better to just 
stay quiet and not say anything than to try to defend that garbage. Another example over the weekend, Todd, you set out, I mean, you you did the Pavlov's dog thing with the Iowa women's basketball call against UConn. A lot of people who just took the bait on there, just tried to, tried to prove you wrong, just couldn't leave it alone. It would have been better if they would have said nothing at all than to say what they said and prove themselves to be fools. Uh, this is another example of that. It would be better if Donald Trump just said nothing at all or just stood by the original talking point earlier in that statement that he put out this morning that, hey, it's just better when life uh, proliferates. It's better when we have a culture of life and just Amen. just left it there. Because as along the lines in, in the same vein of what you were saying, Steve, the people who vote on this issue either against baby killing, you've already got all of those. You've, you've pretty much maxed those people out with very few exceptions. Along the people who vote on pro-baby killing, they are going to hear this if they do it all, and they think, great, uh, you're still literally Hitler. They, they're never going to win those people over. You're just not. Not on this issue. So again, I just think it would have been better for him to say nothing at all or just stay, stick to the, the talking point because they're not going to leave you alone on this. I don't understand what the calculus is. If it's to get, garner more voters, I don't think you're going to I don't think you're going to peel off any support from people who uh, resonate with this issue. If it was an effort to just get the media and get the, the, the left to leave you alone on this issue, they're not going to do that. Never they never happen. they never will. So, again, it would have so, been better to say nothing. So to, what you said here is this this really good insight. And I think so what Steve's brought before when the answer is significantly longer than the inquiry or the question, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so that statement, both written and the video, and it's all prepared. And even though it comes off off the cuff, it's all prepared for what he's going to say if he would just have pointed out the democrats extreme position on this issue and then remind the american people i will always be a champion for the culture of life whether it's at the state level the federal level whatever it is i will champion a culture of life that's all he needed to say yes. and be done with it and even though a lot of people say well he didn't say anything well he said he would champion a culture of life that's all he needed to say and be done now he's good. I, I'm afraid what this has happened, though, something that he does not want in the presidential campaign. That's why he did it early. I really believe that. Put it out there early. Get rid of it. He's only highlighted this. I think we're going to be talking about this all the way through November. Correct. 5th. I mean, I, the other side's not going to say, oh, you know what? You addressed your position in <laughs> April. So we're good. Exactly. You sold well, us. We're, 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 we're going to move we, on to talking about uh, record high inflation and interest rates so, at so your what, command, sir. So what happens there, Steve, those that you have the right, you know, whether it's SBA and others, you know, calling them out for being weak on it. And you got the left who are calling them out for being an extreme on it. You cannot win the argument the way he just positioned it. And that is a problem for his candidacy on November 5. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. When we come back, it'll be your turn to ask me anything. Stay tuned. Right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erz and Aaron McIntyre and all of you. I have a hypothesis just as one final epilogue on the conversation we were just having that occurred to me during the break, and I want to get to it here in a minute, and then we'll put a bow on that and move on to Ask Me Anything, okay? Yep. Uh, don't forget, you can let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Just email us, steve at stevedace.com. You can like us on Facebook, MeWe and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you listen to the podcast version of the show, if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a five-star review if you like the show. Hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, follow, and that way every single time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed every single time. This part of the show brought to you by our friends over at ExpressVPN. Have you ever tried browsing in incognito mode? Well, it's probably not as incognito as you might think, and why would it be? Uh, like the Chrome browser itself, it's a Google product. And Google has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. There's even a $5 billion class action lawsuit against the company in California where it is being accused of secretly collecting user data. What was Google's defense in this case? Well, incognito does not mean invisible. What's an incognito? Like, what's a woman? What's a border? What's a law? All right. So 
how do you truly make yourself invisible? Well, one of the best ways uh, is to get with ExpressVPN. Um, every time you connect, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers. That makes it harder for third parties to identify you or harvest your data. And best of all, it's super easy to use no matter what device you're on, a phone, laptop, smart TV. All you have to do is tap one button for instant protection. So if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. That's ExpressVPN. You can visit ExpressVPN, V as in victory expressvpn.com slash Steve and get three extra months for free when you sign up for a year at expressvpn.com slash Steve. Get three extra months when you sign up for a year at expressvpn.com slash Steve. All right, before we move on to Ask Me Anything, the question was raised last hour I think by all of us to varying degrees, what's the point of doing this today? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Why why did he choose today to bring this up? And as I was just uh, moseying around, stretching my legs out during the break, I had a eureka. I think I may know. Do tell. Well, what did I say last hour? The number one thing that Trump will respond to is what? Look at the polls! Right? Okay. Oh. Hey guys, have you noticed because I don't have I don't have the time to consume a lot of other conservative media or any other media for that matter. And so much of my media consumption comes from what I see on X where I can collect it, coagulate it all together to save me some time, right? Have you guys noticed that just there's not a lot of our uh you know, people on the right doing a lot of uh media coverage about polls the last week or so? Have you noticed this? Seeming or, or betting odds? What do you mean? Exactly. What are they? Yeah. Because there has been a bit of a, well, relative to where he was, (laughs) there has been a bit of a a Biden resurgence in the polls. In fact, one of the most accurate pollsters of the last few years, Emerson, actually put out a poll last week with likely voters. I think it's a little early yet to be identifying who the likely voters are, you know, in April. But likely voters is typically how you get a more accurate reading than with registered voters. It actually found when it switched from registered to likely voters that Biden was actually ahead. The betting odds at the beginning, the betting the betting odds on March 7th had Trump 53%, Joe Biden 32%. April 7th, so this weekend, this past weekend, Trump 47%, Biden 43 That's basically a flip of a coin. Trump said the day after the 2022 midterms, because of course, you know, he's not going to take any responsibility. And, and there's no one group to blame for 2022. Was it Mitch McConnell's fault? Was it Donald Trump's fault? Yeah. Did Donald Trump's candidates underperform? I mean, I don't know. Are you enjoying Senator Blake Masters in Arizona right now? No? So yeah, they underperformed. Did Mitch McConnell's candidates fail to inspire? Yeah. But, you know, it's not really in the essence of Trump to accept responsibility for anything, right? So the day after the 2022 midterms were a disappointment, Trump came out and put the blame where? You guys remember? Yeah. Yeah, he blamed pro Eifer, said you guys didn't show up enough. I did this Roe versus Wade thing for you guys didn't show up for enough. Show up. We actually did show up. Um, the We actually won the generic congressional ballot by about two points nationwide, just as the polls said we were going to. We won. Um, we lost independence again, as we have every single election cycle since Donald Trump became the standard bearer of the party. Lost him, in, lost him badly in 2018, lost him not as bad in 2020, but still not bad, still bad, and lost him very closely in 2022, and that was the difference in that election. Independent voters voting on uh, abortion typically? Mm. No, no, they're not. So he's been on this narrative from the beginning. You have to keep in mind, this guy's a former Planned Parenthood donor. All right. You have to understand this, you know, this is not a deep conviction to him. The reason I I do know from talking to him and people around him back in 2013, 14 and 15, I do know on a personal level, I know this for a fact 
he was morally repulsed when Governor Cuomo was talking about when they remember when Cuomo and the Democrats took over the first piece of legislation they signed in New York. One of them was that thing where you can kill the baby even after birth. I know he was abhorred at that. I heard that from him directly because the Republican Party was originally trying to get him to run for governor in New York. But he wanted to run for president. So I do know that's a big thing for him as it would be really with anybody who still has a morsel of a conscience left. Right. Okay, But beyond that, this just is not his jam. And I, I think that, I mean, he's had this narrative embedded in his brain since the day after the 2022 midterms that we're just too pro-life. And this is just a continuation of that. So you see a little bit, you see a bit of a Biden resurgence in the polls, which is why you're not seeing as many stories about polls on the right right now, because we, we're not going to make any money uh, telling you guys that Joe Biden's doing better. Who's, who's clicking on that on the right? Like not even our show which may defy clickbaitism as much as anybody on a large platform. Aaron, are you going to put a, a an introduction on YouTube of the show today? Joe Biden coming back in the polls. We got to put that on YouTube? No. We got to put that in the introduction on the uh, on iTunes? No. No. Of course not. There's no money to be made with that message. That's why you're not hearing it, but that is happening. The betting markets are the betting markets this early are nothing but a reflection of polls. They don't have any inside information other than the polls. They just react to that. So the reason why the betting markets have come have become nearly 50-50 is because the polls have gotten tighter. What if, he's, what if the reason this had to be done today, because he's had this narrative in his mind since the day after 2022, so we have to do this today when nobody even asked. Was anybody asking Trump, hey, update your abortion? Like, no one was asking this. Could very well be. This is just reactions to the polls. And he is convinced that that's what cost us in 2022 when the data says the exact opposite. But for him to accept that data would require Donald Trump to accept some responsibility. Not all his, but some. And you're never going to get Donald Trump to accept any responsibility. It's not what he does. He brags about bankruptcies, trades and wives when they get too much tread on the tires. Okay. These are just, this is the, this is the sunk cost. There's always a sunk cost with any general, right? Does anybody come with no baggage? No. No. There's a sunk cost of having me as host of this show. You might hear phrases that make you grimace like puss out like you did last hour, right? Everybody's a sunk cost. Everybody brings baggage to the table. We all have crosses to bear, right? Yes. All right. So with Donald Trump as your standard bearer, the baggage you have to assume is among them is you have to know he will take responsibility for nothing. It will always be somebody else's fault, even if that means it's yours when it's really his. That's just the reality. And you don't get into his inner sanctum saying, hey, Don, it's your fault. You just don't do that. All right. So this actually, if you stop and think about it, it lines up with the narrative that he tried to set the very next day after the 22 midterms and that he has kept up with the entire primary. Our very uh, my, our, our former producer, Rebecca Maxwell, was the young woman who asked him the question on Fox News and the Iowa caucuses about abortion, and his answer to her, well, we got to win elections. He's had this embedded in his mind, that, that, it, that our, his own base is to blame for the disappointment of the last couple of elections, not himself. And now that the polling data is showing Biden is doing better and the betting markets are responding, lo and behold, I've got a brand new statement that we're a pro-choice uh, party now. Thoughts. That's the epiphany I just had during the break. Is Aaron right? Yes. Politically speaking, for almost everybody. And again, not, I, I'm, not make, I'm not making the argument to do this. Is this just reality that... In either direct, you, you you can't gain anything by doing more than just saying I'm pro life in the most generic possible way. Can like any is there any rhetoric within national federal political elections? Continue to do what you do on the state level because obviously inroads can be made there. As a church, you never put your light under a bushel basket. But honestly, this is you can't win. That you just said you know the you he can't win voters. He thinks he can win with this. But, like, what, by being vocally, insanely pro-life, um, we, we actually voted against that, a version of that, because it was just Trump's time. I mean, the moment we are in, on a national political discourse level, uh, uh, this is what you do, Steve. Ultimately, at the end of the day, 
you're about messaging. Is there a pro-life message in national political elections that really changes the terra firma of things currently? No. Anybody who disagrees with you on this is not moving based on no matter how you communicate or nuance your position. So See, this I, is dumb. My point is this is dumb on two levels. Yeah. He's a Republican. I overturned Roe v. Wade standard bear. You've laid that out. Why as if you're you, now suddenly going to be yeah. seen as a moderate voice by your enemies. But also just totally not Republican, not Democrat, just knowing this. I mean, really, would it be any of us? Here's the, here's the re, here, We've talked about this before. There are some issues that if they are front and center, even on days that you're right about them, it's a loser for you. Okay. If you're Donald Trump, the reality is anybody who's voting on abortion, who's there, who's who, anybody who's voting on your position on abortion is unlikely listening to the rest of you, is unlikely listening to the rest of your message right. if they dislike abortion. Right. So it doesn't really do you any good to be talking about it at all. Like, and by you, you're saying almost anybody, yeah, right? Yeah, you're, you've got so many other issues to hit Biden yeah. on. Well, that's why we're talking about it now, Steve, to get it out of the way. They're not going to let you get it out of the way. All right? So they, they, they win when the talk is about abortion because that's really the only issue that the number one voting block for Democrats, single women, are voting on. So, th so th that so you can't win. There, there's no win there. So you have to present a wider variety of issues that people would vote for you on yeah. to counteract the zealotry of largely white single, well, black women like to abort their kids too, white and black women who just want to kill their babies whenever they want after they get knocked up. All right, they want to they want to yeah. act out and then they want to kill their kids. They just want to be serial killers, frankly. So you need to expand the issue repertoire beyond that. Yeah, this is dumb on multiple levels. Let's do a thought experiment, can we, real quick? Let's say that a Dusty Devers, or one of the leaders at Abolitionists Rising, had not just a one-hour, but a half-day meeting with Donald Trump, laying out the philosophical, moral, uh, and political case for abolitionism as it pertains to baby killing. And after that meeting, as a result of that meeting, Donald Trump then has a spiritual as much as he can, reawakening to this issue. And instead of coming out this morning with the statement he gave, he came out with the statement this morning saying, after a careful thought and consideration, I'm now more proud than ever to have been the president who appointed the justices who overturned Roe v. Wade. And after more careful consideration, I now believe that the only scientifically and morally just and consistent way forward for this country as a complete abolition of abortion and the criminalization, the criminalization of the doctors who attempt to perform them. So help me God. Would Donald Trump lose significant support for that say, s statement? Yes. I'm, I'm not significant support, you believe? Yeah. From the right wing. So yep. Yep. then what? what because we there's a plenty. There's plenty of people faking that. There, see, th this is the thing. It, it doesn't work the other way. I know where you're going. It doesn't work the other this way. This is why I asked. The there's question, a lot yeah. of people faking that they're pro-life on the other side, provided we're just talking about late term or, or abortion on demand, but want to be able to if, you, if the kids. I mean, Sean Hannity literally told a rape survivor on his show once that he thought rape children, a woman who was conceived in rape, literally told her on his show once that 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 these are these we, these babies are demon spawn many people on the right so-called right believe this okay they, they, they it's not just exceptions because of politics it's moral to them I, that there are times i should be able to kill my kid when i want there are plenty of republican women especially who feel this way do i think they're a majority of pro-life women no but are they a significant portion yep do we want to go to the, if that's true, and I believe that, I didn't necessarily think that that was true to the degree that you've articulated, but let's Let let's me define significant. That. Could he lose 10 to 15, 20% of Republican women with the Dusty Deaver position? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You so, can decide for, decide for yourself if that's significant or not. I kind of think that it is. Yeah, that is significant. Yeah. Well, so he only has if, to if use it, what to lose an election? I mean, he doesn't even have to lose 10. How much does he have to lose, to your point? Yeah. Well, maybe 1%, 2%. Yeah. So in this yeah. thought experiment... Do we want to go down that rabbit hole of what that actually means? Uh, what, like, what the hell are we doing here? If we can't even, 
morally, if we're not aligned on that level, and I'm not saying that you have to, you can cloak it in abolition, if, if we're not even close to being morally aligned on that issue, not even, let's just say 5 to 15%, if we're not even close to being morally aligned on that issue, what's the Republican Party useful for at a national level? Okay. Now I'm going to call an audible. Since, since this does open up a broader can of worms, let's do this. I don't want to short the people that submitted questions because I, I asked them. They earnestly submitted them, and I want to give them the time they deserve, okay? Yeah. So next Monday, we're going to use these exact same questions. I won't solicit ones next weekend. Can we do that? Because we're, we're already a quarter of the way through this hour, okay? And next Monday, we'll just use these very questions for Ask Me Anything. Is that okay? Yeah, I think they're mostly evergreenish. Aaron has them in front of me right now, but I think that would apply. Yeah. Okay. Because there, there are there's a there's a broader conversation here now that I think needs to be had, and we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we just kind of left it sitting there with what with with what Aaron has broached. Mm-hmm. So let, let's do this. Let, let's talk about um, let's talk about our friends uh, over at Jace Medical first. Um, just like back during the pandemic today, we're facing drug and medical supply shortages right here in the U.S. As of March, there were more than 200 drug shortages here. Looking like it could get a whole lot worse, too, before it gets any better. Uh, that's why you want to make sure uh, to check out our friends at Jace Medical. Um, they originally came along because they didn't want to see a repeat of what we saw during COVID. Where venerable drugs that may or may not have been effective against the scandemic we're now suddenly, despite their effectiveness overall, being labeled dangerous or horse-paced, being banned. Uh, you are being denied prescriptions from your physician by pharmacists. Um, they didn't want that to happen again. But now there's a broader application here, too. Now we're just let's go brandoning on every level here. All right. So all you got to do is fill out a simple form. And you can get the five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use like doxycycline, amoxicillin, and others right there in your Jace case for peace of mind. And they also let you expand it, too, so that you can go after the drugs you specifically need or even more so a loved one right now that you're worried. Maybe I can't trust the government health care people to give her, you know, my grandmother that I love, what she needs. You can't. So take it upon yourself with our friends over at Jace Medical. Uh, check them out today. Use the promo code DACE for a discount at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E is how it is spelled. J-A-S-E. Discount code DACE at jacemedical.com. Discount code DACE at jacemedical.com. What's happening here? And And this is just the most... I think blatant example of it because this is the issue that created the modern Republican coalition. And to to understand why this is so important, you got to understand the history of it. You know, some of you maybe grew up hearing about Reagan's three legged stool. Some of us are old enough to remember that. What was the three legged stool? Fiscal conservatives, national defense conservatives, cultural conservatives or Christian conservatives, right? In 1964, Barry Goldwater was enthusiastically backed by Ronald Reagan. He gave, Reagan gave probably his most famous speech, the time for choosing the rendezvous for destiny on the eve of the 1964 election on behalf of Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater went out there and got absolutely destroyed. Because there's really not that many fiscal conservatives There's not that many in 2024. There weren't that many in 1964. I mean, wait, you mean I can vote myself other people's money? Kind of hard to say no to that, right? Most people. Well, that's abundantly clear. Yeah. yeah. And the and the and the more secular and the less divorced you become from the laws of nature and nature's God. So the less accountable you are to something beyond yourself, the less willing you're going to be to restrain yourself Mm -hmm. in that regard, right? National defense conservatives. You know, we had just come out of. World War II, we had just come out of the Korean War, thoughts now of escalating in Vietnam, which ironically, LBJ ended up doing anyway. After beating the warmonger, Barry Goldwater, he ended up escalating the war in Vietnam anyway, okay? But did we want another war? Did we, you know, Eisenhower just a decade ago had warned about the military, or five years ago, had just warned about the military industrial complex. You know, kids are hiding under their school desks doing bomb, you know, bomb drills. People were tired, man. 
and you got this tough talking guy from Arizona. We're tired. Can we focus on our, any of this sound familiar? Can mm-hmm. we kind of focus on ourselves for a while? Okay. And so there really weren't, now, by our standards, there were a lot of national defense conservatives in 1964, okay? But by the standards of 1964, we're going full MacArthur and we're marching on Moscow, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, full Patton, I should say. There weren't that many of those, all right? So he got obliterated. By 1980, now, there is a third leg. And this third leg's way bigger, the Christian cultural conservative, way bigger. It dwarfs all the other legs. And it's the people that are most likely to be your worker bees, your volunteers, your activists to get involved, okay, to do the kind of stuff that saves you money as a, as a, as a party and a campaign that people will just do for you out of the sincerity of their devotion to the cause. And so with virtually the exact same platform that... L, that, that Goldwater got obliterated on in 1964 with two additions. The supply side economics, tax cutting for economic growth argument that JFK actually made in 1960. And now the Christian conservative group, all of a sudden now Ronald Reagan, the last couple of weeks for fun, I've gone on YouTube and watched the election night coverage from 1980 and 1984 on the various networks. It is something to behold. Okay, it is. <laughs> Steve Dace did that for fun. Yes, that's a, that's a Saturday night for me at 50. It is something to behold to watch these. California going for Mr. Reagan. New York going for Mr. You're like, what timeline is this? Okay. Well, what you're really talking about now is, is, is splintering that coalition. And keep in mind, we're going to do this at a time that we're coming off our biggest win. Only the Republican Party could figure out how do we take the biggest cultural win we've had in 50 years, which I've, I'm going to continue to give Trump credit for, even though some of you hate it, because I think he deserves credit for it, even though right now he doesn't want to claim it. But how do you take arguably your biggest win and turn it into an L? Here's how. Can't outrun the biblical worldview, guys. We can't outrun it. House divided against itself cannot stand. Can, t- can two walk arm in arm unless they see eye to eye? Don't be unevenly yoked. Should I go on? This is the ultimate example that the Republican Party is not a big tent. It is a big tarp. And there's a major difference between the two structures. A tent has stakes. Why do you put a stake in the ground, Todd? for a tent why do you do that to keep it from getting blown away lifted off keep it stable gives it a foundation does it not yeah has a corner to it Mm. because you you also put the stakes typically you start putting the stakes where in the corner in the corners so there's like a cornerstone laid Mm -hmm. some might say right yeah okay what's a tarp you're a big baseball guy tarp comes out for what rain delays temporarily temporarily do they put stakes in the ground uh, not like they do for a tent. Right. I mean, if they do, there is significantly right. less. Um, if they do build an, if, if they yeah, if they are putting stakes in the ground, build they're an also arc. very, very, very temporary. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The, but the point is, yes. hey, we have a temporary problem. Right. We need shelter from that problem. We have to protect our assets from that problem. So we work together to wheel this thing out to cover the diamond, right? And then once the storm is gone, we roll it back and we go back to normal, right? Yes. Now here's the thing. When you cover that baseball diamond, is everybody on that field on the same team? No. No. They all agree with the covering of the field to protect it, though, right? Mm -hmm. They have a shared asset there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But once the tarp is rolled back and it's play ball, the kumbaya kind of ends now. Now we're trying to win the game, even though just a few minutes ago we agreed we had to protect this the field that we all were going to play on. You see where I'm going with Mm -hmm. this? See, that's what the Republican Party is. It is a collection, not even a coalition. A collection. Coalition would be an upgrade. It is a collection of disparate belief systems and value systems that are united not by a cornerstone or stakes in the ground. If you don't put stakes in the ground of a tent, the center will not hold. It will either blow away or it might just implode straight down upon you. That's, the, the, that's, the, that's what the Republican Party is not. It's not a tent. It's a tarp. 
The Democrats are the storm clouds in my analogy. They would like to come along and take this shared, this shared ground we're all competing on called America and just f- desecrate it, muddy it up, blow it up, make the, make the playing field unplayable, right? At least that's how we view it anyway, right? So then we all will get together, okay, pause the game, cover the field till the storm passes, till we get, to get rid of the storm. So we hide out in our tents or, our, or hide under the tarp or in our dugouts, right? But when the storm passes... We, we can't be on the same team. We're not aligned. We're not. I, I don't honestly know what I have in common with Nancy Mace. I really don't. Do you know? No. Let's just look at South Carolina, supposedly our most red state or one of them. What do, you, do you know what you have in common with Lindsey Graham? No. Effeminate, strangely unmarried, forever war, open borders. Do you know what you have in common? I don't have anything in common with him. What do you, what do you have in common with Kurt, all hat, no cattle, Gowdy? I mean, you're pretty white. You're still not as white well, as he is. There's, we're all not Democrats. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. What do you, but funda- well, fundamentally, Tim Scott, I mean, uses the same Bible verse as we do, but mm-hmm. then, you know, uses it to bear false witness against, mm-hmm. you know, judicial appointments that he, uh, d- that he smears and slanders as racist. And again, open borders. You see what I'm saying? Strangely unmarried. You know, yeah. Okay. This is, this is like our best state. It's like our best state. And I have like nothing in common with like any of the major political figures it produces. Now let's do like another state that's not nearly that red. Michigan. Wisconsin. We really don't have anything in common with one another other than a mutual disdain. You cannot sustain a movement like that. You can't. And I'm going to do Todd's work for him and use my own religious tradition to prove my point. It was a Protestant reformation, not revolution. It was a protest. They were united for about 15 minutes. Then they had to talk about their own doctrinal issues, and it didn't last. Now, by some estimates, we have anywhere from 29,000 to 50,000 different denominations and, and sects of Christianity in the, country, in the world today. Because you can't stay unified on what you're against. Well, we just, we just don't want to adopt the Roman mysticism and go back to that. Okay. What are we going to do instead? We have no idea, and we're not going to agree. So now we got like 12 different, there's like 50 different Lutheran denominations, for goodness sakes. That's the Republican Party. More in a moment. Hey, did you know Fast Growing Trees is the largest online nursery in the U.S. with 10,000 different kinds of plants, over 2 million happy customers in the U.S. We're now one of them. Uh, We got our delivery over the weekend. Looking forward to uh, seeing what it's going to do this spring and summer. You can find the perfect fit for your climate space, climate and space, I should say. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online, so easy even Amy and I could do it. And we don't know anything about this stuff. Um, Your plants are shipped directly to your door within a a couple of days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. You don't even need to have a yard. I mean, you can grow lemon, avocado, olive, fig trees inside your home on top of a wide variety of houseplants that are available, too. Again, they'll make it specific to your climate, location, and needs. They've got the best deals online, and if you're one of ours here on uh, the Steve Day Show, you'll get an additional 15% off your first purchase with the code DACE at checkout. That's an additional 15% off with the code DACE at checkout when you go to fastgrowingtrees.com, use the offer code DACE. That's fast growing trees.com offer valid a limited time terms and conditions may apply all right let me do this i i I went through a lot of history and i want to make sure i'm not like just rambling because this is a this is i think is a pivotal moment in terms of political science in the history of the right at least 
in the modern history of it. So I want to I want to make sure I'm not just rambling and giving out trivia, but I'm, I'm using anecdotal and historical information that is useful in this conversation today. So let me put a put a pin in everything I was just saying, because I said quite a bit. Let me go to each of you guys one by one. Aaron, let me start with you. And you can either add to what I was just talking about, react to it, take the conversation someplace different, but the floor is yours. Well, regarding your answer to my thought experiment of whether Trump would lose support if he just came out as an explicit abolitionist or at least espoused the uh, espoused the foundations of that, what I believe is a superior uh, line of thinking ideology to whatever the hell, hell, pro-life, uh, pro-liferism is now. In regards to that thought experiment, you know, my question was, if we can't align at least somewhat or at least not at least be accepted, that's kind of what I was getting getting into. The left accepts a ton of stuff that necessarily they wouldn't necessarily run on as a as a primary issue. They accept a lot of stuff. If we can't even be ex- ex- accepted, if 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 a line of thought like abolitionism can't even be accepted within the Republican tent or tarp as you laid out Mm -hmm. what is the point of being under that tarp to begin with and then this tweet from the daily wires michael knowles came across my twitter feed just as you were talking in that last segment and i think it dovetails to where this conversation went off air during the break and as i read this and michael knowles i have not been a fan of him especially during the primary but he's just one of many (laughs) that i've uh, been disappointed with He asked this question, and it took me back at the beginning, but I actually, as I thought about it more and as I was subsequently listening to you or simultaneously listening to you, I think it's a valuable question uh, to where this conversation needs to go. And he says, regarding criticism of President Trump's abortion statement, has there been or could there be today any even remotely electable GOP presidential candidate with a different view? One hopes things improves as the pro-life movement advances, but what better option could there be today? Do you think that's a good question? Because whether or not you whether you not whether or not you like the premise of that question, whether or not you like the answers to that question, I happen to think it's a good question. I do not agree with. I hate the premise. Yes. But do I get to? Do, does the premise change whether or not I like it or not? No. And the answer to your question regarding my thought experiment is that Donald Trump would lose support amongst his own supporters. That's what you're saying. Yep. A significant amount if he embraced the tenets of abolitionism. That's kind of the premise that Michael Knowles, I think, whether he knows it or not, is articulating. It's an excellent question by Mr. Knowles. I'm not surprised whether you agree with him or not. Michael is very smart. Um. He is correct. I don't know him well enough to know if I would agree, we would agree with why he is correct. Okay. Um, How do I want to put this? You know what? Let's do this. I'll answer your question in a moment. Let's talk about our friends at My Patriot Supply. So I've got a few extra seconds to gather my thoughts on how I want to answer this question as well. Okay. Um, if, If you watched Aaron's montage today, If you're watching governors call in states of emergency over a lunar eclipse and you're thinking, what is happening? Yep. Just make sure you're ready. You never know. I mean, calling in states of emergencies over lunar eclipses like it's, you know, 3000 BC. What is that? Your first step, go to preparewithdace.com. Get the three-month emergency food kit. Um, Actually, you know what? Stock up on multiple one-week food kits at this point. Uh, priced at under 50 bucks. Now is the time to buy them in bulk. Uh, these one-week kits with ready-hour foods, uh, they provide over 2,000 calories a day. That's breakfast, lunch, dinner, even snacks. They're sealed inside a rugged ammo can. Got to like that. They'll last up to 25 years with proper storage. Just grab it and go in case of emergencies. Get these kits for under 50 bucks. You can't beat it. At preparewithdace.com. That's preparewithdace.com. Get the one week emergency food kit for just 50 bucks at preparewithdace.com. Trump is going to lose support on the right with this position, too, that he's articulated today. Okay. 
I mean, if, if you are in the emerging abolitionist camp, if you are in the personhood camp, and that, that's not a lot of people on the right either, but it's also, it may not be 10 to 15% like Republican women who would revolt if he was took the true pro-life position, but it might be two, three, or four, or 5%. And, and But it's probably in places that Trump can't lose anyway. Probably. Probably. Meaning like Oklahoma, for yes. example, where Devers is from. Probably. Um, you know, I'll say more likely. I'll put it that way. Okay. What's, what's happened here? How do I want to put this? I still don't know that. I, you know what? I'll just put it bluntly. What's happened here is we have BSed each other a lot over the years. We have largely defined our positions by the opposition than what we are for. Because again, we're tarp. We're not a tent. A tent would be an upgrade. We're not a movement. We're a reaction. And so I'm pro-life with uh, John McCain. I'm pro-life with the exceptions of uh, rape, incest, and life of the mother. Do you know that you could just literally walk into any Planned Parenthood in America, the ones that are still open anyway, and, and, and say, I think my life's in danger, and they'll kill your kid for you at any point, any stage. We spent like $40 million overturning late partial birth abortion, and yet we're one of only like seven or eight countries left in the world who still does it. Why? We've sold each other a lot of BS. The Republican Party wanted us to tell you that they were superheroes. You wanted to buy the message that they were superheroes. And so we sold you the message that they were superheroes because that's also the message the Republican Party wanted us to give you. And that's been done for decades. And so we're imploding because the Lord will tolerate such chicanery for only so long. And then the check comes due. The bill comes due. And it's coming due culturally right now. What Michael is saying, and if, if, if this is what Michael is saying, I agree with it. In many respects, Donald Trump today gave the most honest Republican position on abortion any Republican presidential candidate actually has. Because this is really, truly what they've all thought. At least all the ones that won the nomination. Because really, truly, this is what we think. Um, a guy, an old friend of mine, Dr. Lawrence White, very, very conservative Lutheran minister, Houston, Texas, used to go around the country and, and we used to have him on the show. And he used to say his speech was the killing will stop when we make it stop and not a moment sooner. Why does it go on? Because we're OK with it. And, and over time, we have gotten to be less tolerant of certain forms of this barbarism. You know, but in the end, hey man, I got this girl pregnant. I don't want ever people to know. My daughter got raped. We, we're okay with it. That's, that's why it continues. We have allowed people that are not pro-life to be billed as pro-life because they were for less killing than Democrats. But like, would you consider serial killers, if you were comparing serial killers, think of some of the most heinous ones. John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy. Would the one who killed less, would he be pro-life to you? <laughs> You're laughing. I do you remember, do you, Todd, do you remember those interviews I did with Richard Land and Tom Minnery back in the day? Do you remember the question that was that blew up those interviews? Do you remember what it was? I re I, I've told you I remember where I was standing when one of them was going on because it just, how you just utterly it was this, paralyzed him. It, and this was the question that paralyzed him. How many babies can a Republican kill and still yeah. be pro-life? That was my question. We have created a movement with the intent of, of of getting the political outcomes we want. And so that's not a movement. 
The other side has a movement and therefore gets the political outcomes that it wants. Means the polit- meaning that they don't view this as, it's not a means to an end. The cause is the means unto the end itself. By the way, you know that mimics? Christianity. We just did this whole thing, this apologetic on the resurrection last week, right? And what was one of the things that I said? Hey, you, you, if you want to reject all this evidence, then you must come up with a counter narrative. And here's the only counter narrative you have. That these disciples hid the body and it was never found. And they retconned their, their, their letters in the New Testament to just check boxes of Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and applied them, reverse engineered them to this dead carpenter. And then they all went to their deaths with no worldly benefit whatsoever to this lie. Like, you want to sit there and say, like the New Omen movie does, well, the church was so desperate because of secularism that they create, they, they're trying to birth the Antichrist into the world to scare people into returning to Christianity so they can keep their hegemony. That's literally the plot of the New Omen movie. That, did, did they have all those cathedrals in the first century, Todd? No. no did, did they have a Swiss guard in the first century, Todd? No. no. Did they have mega churches in the first century, Aaron? No. No, I mean, did, 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 were, they, were, were pastors taking 97 offerings for healings on TBN in the first century? No. I don't think so. They had nothing! Nothing! And they died with nothing. They died alone with nothing. So then your, your alternative narrative is they died alone with nothing for nothing. That's your alternative. It might be true. They'd be the worst, dumbest nitwits in the history of planet Earth, though, if that were, right? But those are your options. The worst, dumbest nitwits in the history of planet Earth, or they witnessed the most extraordinary thing in the history of the planet Earth, but there's nothing in between, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's how the other side operates. With so much conviction in the belief of their cause, they're willing to suffer for what they believe. And worse, they're willing to make everybody else suffer for it, too. We've been lying and gaslighting each other all this time. Michael is correct. I'm not sure if this is the context that he means, because I don't know. I'd have to talk to him. But this is the most honest pro-life position than any Republican presidential nominee since Reagan has given. He's just telling you, I'm not really pro-life. I think some abortion practices are just absolutely barbaric. That is what most of them have thought, which is why the killing has continued. Make it a zygote of six, five, six, four, five, six weeks. And don't make me see the pictures of it. And my conscience is clear. Make it a kid conceived in rape and incest, like several members of my family were. Tell me the mother's life is in danger, like my own wife's was. And it's okay. This is actually, and we called that pro-life. This has happened in the Republican Party before. In fact, this is how the Republican Party was even founded and formed. And a guy came along named Abraham Lincoln that said, no, that's that's not the premise of the argument. We're going to stop doing that. Unfortunately, it helped cause a civil war. We're way too comfortable to fight for things like little babies. Yes, we are. That's, that is the... So we're going to Stephen Douglas this son of a gun until interest rates are like 30%, and then we might actually do something about it. Because the comfort is still way high. So I, I wouldn't own a slave. I think slavery is abhorrent. But if Bleeding Kansas wants to have slaves, not what I would do. But not my problem. Much of what we represent and who we are is a fraud. Something we've just sold each other and we wanted each other to be sold on it. In 2016, when Trump ran and then when he got into office, he exposed them. What's happening now is he's exposing us. Yes. Hey, you want to get something real special for your parents? For their special days like Mother's and Father's Day? 
This year you can have this year you can have a portrait of one of their favorite memories, hand painted by Paint Your Life. It's a terrible segue, but it's a great product. I mean, one of the coolest gifts I've given my mom in recent years is this photo right here. I took this photo. It's the oldest one I have of my mom and I together. And I gave it over to Paint Your Life and look at the work they did with it. It's hanging up in my mom's home, in fact. It's just gorgeous. This is a great way to preserve memories. Get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. It's a user-friendly platform that'll make it as customizable as absolutely possible. It's the perfect, unique gift. Birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day. You can't beat it. All right? And there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. Limited time offer right now. Get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping, which with these paintings, that's a that's a nice expense to not have to pay. To get this special offer, text the word DACE to 87204. DACE to 87204. That's text DACE to 87204. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. All right, I'm going to call an audible on the overtime. We're going to continue this conversation Good. and finish it, okay? Because there's too many dangling participles, and Todd, I know you've got stuff to say. So we're going to finish it right now, record it right now for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow. Romans 828.